So we'll remember again the solution for a bottom Ekman layer. We will revise the solution for a bottom Ekman layer, which is important in the ocean because there's friction with the bottom, of course. But we will also derive the solution for the top Ekman layer, which is the one that is most important for the ocean. And we'll see if that's the most important for the ocean because that's how the momentum from the wind stress is communicated to the interior of the ocean and how the large scale ocean circulation, the wind driven ocean circulation, is is set up is through wind stress at the surface and the communication of the momentum to the interior is provided by the uh, top Ekman layer, okay, through Ekman pumping. And then we'll give a few examples of of the importance of Ekman layers, but not only Ekman layers, but specifically Ekman pumping. Okay. So I think that the last time we stopped here, so we derived the uh, the integral of well, the, the equations for a frictional geostrophic uh, column, okay, where you have the interior, which is in geostrophic balance, and a boundary layer correction where you have friction that is important, so you cannot neglect the frictional terms. Okay, so we had that frictional geostrophic uh, balance in the column. Then we derived the integral properties for the Ekman layer, where we derived a um, agiostrophic mass transport. Okay, which was only dependent on the wind stress, or, or I should say, the uh, the uh, frictional stress, whatever that is, the bottom or the surface. So you can derive the uh, the integrated agiostrophic mass transport simply by knowing the frictional stress, be it uh, wind stress at the surface or friction with the bottom, for example. And then we derive what is really probably the most important part for the uh, large scale ocean dynamics, which is the Ekman vertical velocities. Okay? So we start with the mass conservation equation. We integrate it over an Ekman layer this way. Okay? And so using the uh, definition for the agiostrophic mass transport, um, we got to this equation, and then the divergence of the agiostrophic mass transport is just given by the curl of the wind stress. That's why I repeat, it's not the wind stress that is driving the large scale ocean circulation, is the curl of the wind stress. Okay. The curl of the wind stress will generate, we'll see that the curl of the wind stress will generate a vertical velocity at the base of the Ekman layer, and that vertical velocity will transmit momentum to the interior of the ocean. Okay, so this is the expression after taking the curl, and then you got, for a top Ekman layer, you have a bottom vertical velocity, because for, for a top Ekman layer at the surface you don't have any vertical velocity, it's just the wind stress, then at the bottom of the Ekman layer you have a vertical velocity associated with it, which is just given by the curl of the wind stress. Okay? And for a bottom Ekman layer you don't have any vertical velocity at the bottom where you have the floor, you just have a vertical velocity at the top of the boundary layer, which is just given by this frictional stress tau, and we will see what that is. Okay. It doesn't depend on the wind stress, of course, because it's a bottom boundary layer, it depends on, on something else. Okay. So friction induces a vertical velocity in the ground layer, which is proportional to the curl of the stress at the surface or at the boundary or the boundary layer. Okay, and that vertical velocity is called Ekman pumping. Ekman pumping or Ekman, it's always called Ekman pumping, but usually Ekman pumping you know, you, you could say Ekman pumping or Ekman suction, depending on, on the direction of the uh, vertical velocity. Okay. And it's probably the most important part of the uh, Ekman layer because it's the one providing and communicating surface fluxes to the interior of the ocean. Okay. So that's, that's really what, what we care about. So now we're going to define the solution for the bottom boundary layer. We will see probably ascend this, but we'll go faster and we'll put it in a context for the ocean. Okay? And then we'll do the same, exactly the same for the top Ekman layer, surface Ekman layer. But we'll see there's a couple of differences that are quite interesting. Okay? Uh, if you are more atmospherically inclined, which is fine, I forgive you, uh, you can think of the bottom boundary layer as a bottom boundary layer in the atmosphere. Okay? Of course, you don't have to think necessarily as the bottom of the ocean.
Okay, so we start with the uh, with the uh, mass conservation. Okay, the use of mass conservation equation and the hydrostatic balance. In the vertical, okay? So remember, we're always gonna put in as fluid, okay? So rho prime is much smaller than rho. It's always gonna put in as approximation. So now you can divide the flow into, again, a geostrophic part and a ageostrophic part, okay? So you have the geostrophic part, which is the balance between so rho naught, because it's Boussinesque, geostrophic part, which is just the balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient. Okay, so this is the part of the uh, geostrophic, the geostrophic uh, flow. And then you have an ageostrophic flow. Okay. Where you actually have the Coriolis, the pressure gradient, and as we said, we're going to use a frictional stress in the vertical. Mm -hmm. okay, so this is the angiostrophic. Okay, remember we're trying to derive the, uh, the solution for a bottom boundary layer. We have two parts of the uh, flow, geostrophic part and angiostrophic part. Uh, now you can combine the two and get the frictional geostrophic balance, which is minus Fv minus Vg. The pressure gradient goes and you're left with a Okay, so you just combine it and you'll see that the pressure gradient vanishes. Okay, so these are the, the equation for the uh, frictional geostrophic flow. Now we need some boundary conditions because we are in a boundary layer, so we need some boundary conditions. So in a bottom boundary layer, we have that at z equals zero. So at the bottom, we have the u, the age of the flow is equal to zero, and v is also equal to zero, right? So these are the uh, no sleep boundary conditions. u and v are equal to zero. That one ug or the second part of the geostrophic? Of the geostrophic? Sorry. Thanks. You, you. Thank you. Okay, so that's the band the uh, so we are doing this. So Z equal to zero. We're gonna have some boundary layer and then adjustrophic flow. So here we're gonna have adjustrophic flow. And we're, here we're going to have some ageostrophic flow. Okay, this is going to be some, some delta, the thickness of the boundary layer. Okay, so at z equals zero, velocities are equal to zero. And then as z approaches infinity, we have that u is equal to the geostrophic flow, and v is equal to the radial component of the geostrophic flow. Okay, so you match the two solutions. If you know matching asymptotics, then you're just matching the solution for the boundary layer to the solution for the interior. Okay? With six solutions, you probably send this to six solutions in the usual way. A naught, E alpha C, and V equal VG plus B naught E alpha Z. Okay, six solutions. 
the standard form. And for constant a and b, you get f a naught minus a b naught alpha square equal to zero and minus f b naught minus a a naught alpha square equal to zero. The two solutions given those the solutions for u and v. Okay, now remember that we um, we were in a business fluid with no horizontal gradients in, in temperatures. And so the thermal wind, thermal wind in this case, reduces to dz of ug is equal to zero and dz of vg is equal to zero, okay? There's no horizontal gradient in temperatures. So thermal wind reduces to that. You can find a solution for the alpha. And given the solution for the alpha, you get a, uh, a parameter that we're going to call d or delta. That is to a over f squared of that. Okay. And that is obviously the depth of the boundary layer. Okay, you have the solutions, you seek uh, solutions for that, no trivial solutions, of course, you don't want parameters to be equal to zero. And then you will get a parameter like this, square root of 2a over f, which we're going to call d. Okay? I'm sure you've derived this before. Uh, now, if we use the boundary conditions, These are my boundary conditions. If we use the boundary conditions, we get for a total solutions for u and v, which is a, pain, a bit of a pain, but I'll actually write it down because then we'll, we'll work on them. Uh, one is z over d. I'm just drawing the velocity. Cosine of zd plus velocity and then d is g plus minus u g times d uh, minus radial component cosine of z okay so using the boundary conditions, you get to the solutions for the angiostrophic velocities. Yeah. Where again, we have used this new parameter d, which will turn out to be the depth of the boundary layer. OK? So basically, what you get is a solution that decays exponentially as you approach the uh, interior geostrophic flow, where the ageostrophic velocity will vanish, and there will be no ageostrophic velocity anymore. And the uh, e-folding decay of the solution is given by d. Okay, that's the mathematical interpretation of the uh, of the solution for the Ekman layer. So now let's suppose that we have a uh, flow that is directed only eastward. So let's say this is. Eastward, okay, and we have only a geostrophic flow in the zonal direction and Vg is equal to zero. Okay, let's suppose a simple case. So now these equations they reduce so Vg is equal to zero and Ug is positive. Okay, so you have that U is Ug one minus D. Sine of D, okay, much easier. Yeah. And V is only the meridional component. 
Bolt. Okay, so this is how the uh, angel star velocity is reduced if the McDonald just off flow is equal to zero and the uh, zona just off flow is positive. Okay, so this is already telling us one simple thing that if you have a uh, zero meridional geostrophic flow, the geostrophic, the ageostrophic meridional component is not zero. Okay. And that's because we're going to need to build a spiral, of course. Okay. So you have a zonal and a meridional component in the ageostrophic flow, even though the geostrophic flow in the meridional direction is equal to zero. So now let's find the solutions as z approaches zero, so towards the bottom, okay. This is the bottom. So as z approaches zero, close to the bottom, what is the solution? The solution is u is the just drop it flow, one minus one minus z over d. And V is just drop the flow, one minus Z over D, Z over D. Uh, e G, one, zero D, zero D. Okay, and this is just U G. Okay, so this is the solution as z approaches zero, so the bottom. And um, if you want to know, if you have not done this, if you want to know how you get to this as z approaches zero, uh, you can expand in. Taylor series e to the minus z d. Okay, the way I've done it is this plus z squared over two z squared, and then the cosine of z d is one minus z squared two d squared. And the sine of Z D is Z over D minus Z cube Okay, so you just do a Taylor series expansion of this and then you neglect higher order terms. And so you get the E to the minus Z D is equal to one. So this is equal to one. The cosine of Z D is also equal to one this and the sine of Z D is Z over D. Okay, so this sine of Z D is Z D. Okay, so you do a Z approaches zero and you do a Taylor expansion for these terms and you get to the solution. Okay, it's very easy. And I think it's all written in the notes anyway. Uh, So this is also equal to u g z equal d. Okay, so the point here is that as z approaches zero, u and v are equal. Okay, and they both depend on the geostrophic velocity and the depth of the Ekman layer. Okay, that's the point. And the point is also that if you have this case and you do and you look at it from the top. Okay, you have a zonal geostrophic flow and no meridional flow. And what you get? You get a U that is positive, and you get a V that is also positive and equal to the U. 
so that the uh, angiostrophic flow would be 45 degrees to the left of the geostrophic velocity okay. as z approaches zero. Okay. So this doesn't contradict the fact that the, uh, the total transport will be 45 degrees to the right for f positive defined. Okay. <coughs> you will see that when you have when you have a wind stress or a stress at the bottom, the integrated mass transport will be 45 degrees to the right in the northern hemisphere. Okay. This is saying that for a top boundary layer, if you have a zonal geostrophic flow, the uh, velocity ages of velocity as z up to zero is going to be 45 degrees to the left. But we'll see that the total transport will be 45 degrees to the right of the stress, okay? which is different. Okay, so this is, this is the point of, of this. Okay? So 45 degrees to the left of the uh, geostrophic transport for our bottom boundary layer. Now we'll also see what happens here. Okay, so what is the local maximum for the velocity within the boundary layer? Okay, so you expect the local maximum to be close to the geostrophic flow, where the boundary layer correction matches the interior geostrophic flow. So, you start by saying that you're close to the geostrophic flow, where you don't have any vertical derivative in the, uh, in the geostrophic flow. So you say, okay, it's a good approximation to say that du by dz is equal to zero in this region. So if the u by dz is equal to zero, this means that d by dz of, of all that, ug minus ug e this is also equal to zero. Okay? And if you do that, it's 1 over d uh, ug e minus d cosine of d plus 1 over d ug e g minus d sine of z over d. Okay? So this goes and you're left with cosine of d plus sine of z over d is equal to zero. We're looking for the maximum velocity. Okay. So this is tan of z d is equal to minus one. Okay. And so the depth of the maximum velocity, what is the depth of the maximum velocity given that is going to be z 3 pi over 4 of d. Okay, so actually the depth of the maximum velocity is outside of the boundary layer. Okay, and why is that? That's because frictional effects can be felt outside of the boundary layer. Okay, so actually the, uh, the interior geostrophic flow actually feels frictional effects that are formed in the boundary layer. Okay. Actually, I think that the um, frictional effects can be felt something like five or six times D. Okay. So actually frictional effects can be felt outside of the boundary layer. So this is the depth of the, uh, of the maximum velocity. And if you replace the depth of the maximum velocity into the uh, velocities, you get that u equal ug 1 minus e 3 pi 4 cosine of 3 pi 4 and this is 1.07 of the geostrophic velocity. Okay? So actually the maximum velocity within the boundary layer is slightly larger than the geostrophic flow. So this should be drawn 
like this. Okay? So actually the maximum velocity within the boundary layer is larger than, than the geostrophic flow and that's because of some redistribution of momentum that can be explained by some redistribution of momentum. Okay. So actually the, uh, the angiostrophic velocity, which is a maximum, a theoretical maximum, that is larger than the geostrophic flow. If you on a theoretical uh, solution. Okay? And it's actually observed in the laboratory. So the maximum velocity can be felt outside of the boundary layer and the maximum velocity is actually larger, can be larger than the geostrophic flow. Okay, so this is the solution for a bottom boundary layer. We're not convinced. The depth of the maximum, yes. The depth of the the depth of the maximum velocity yes, can be felt outside D. And that's because so D is the theoretical depth of the Ekman layer. Okay? But actually frictional effects, they don't stop at D or delta. Frictional effects can actually be felt, you know, it's not this is a mathematical solution where you have a boundary layer correct correction and then you match with interior. But then the reality is not, is not that clear. It's not that you have a geostrophic flow here and the next point below you have a frictional flow. Okay? There's some redistribution of momentum between the ageostrophic part and the geostrophic part. So D delta is the region where you have an ageostrophic flow and zero geostrophic flow. Okay? But then the boundary layer where you feel frictional effects can actually go outside of this theoretical D or delta. So you, have, you can feel frictional effects way into the geostrophic flow in the interior, and you actually get a maximum velocity which can be larger than, than the geostrophic flow. So let's say that this is your delta or D, theoretical, okay? And then the uh, maximum velocity, which is at the depth of the maximum velocity, can actually be larger than the geostrophic. So you might think that this is the region where we do the mathematical description of the uh, frictional flow. Okay? But actually, if you look at the profile of the velocity, it's not a clear cut between the Ekman boundary layer solution and the geostrophic flow. We actually get some redistribution of momentum between the interior and the uh, boundary layer, where you can feel the frictional effects outside of the boundary layer, the theoretical boundary layer, and you have a maximum velocity which is actually larger than the geostrophic flow. Okay, so, so yes. The 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 line is representing the depth of the boundary layer or this. Uh, this can be the depth at which you don't feel frictional stresses anymore. So, so delta is, is not exactly this region. Okay. You can feel frictional effects way into the, uh, way into the interior flow. say that you have a region where you have interior geostrophic flow, where friction can be neglected. It's not zero, but you can neglect the friction, and so you're left with the geostrophic a flow in geostrophic balance. And then you have a region, which is a boundary layer, where friction effects cannot be neglected. That region is delta D, whatever. Okay. So you, 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 solve, you solve your equation for a frictional geostrophic balance, so the entire column. And then in one region you say, okay, here friction cannot be neglected, and you solve your equation, and it's some delta. And then there is a region where you say the, fr the, uh, the effects of friction can be neglected in my equation, so I assume this is just in geostrophic balance. But actually frictional effects can be felt 
much more than Delta, okay? Because there's some redistribution and momentum between the two flows, between the geostrophic part and the ageostrophic part, okay? So it's not, it's not a clear cut between, between the two. Okay? This is just a mathematical description where you, where you match the boundary layer solution with the interior solution. And you do it at some depth, height, or whatever. Okay. But then if you look at laboratory measurements, you see that frictional effects can be felt into the interior. Okay. So now let's look at the transport, and I, I think this is nice because then, then we'll, we'll get a clear picture of what, what is happening at the bottom boundary layer and what is the, uh, the balance between all the forces that we have at the bottom. So let's find an expression for the transport, and again for, for a meridional geostrophic flow, which is equal to zero. Okay. So you, you integrate your meridional flow, and that's just uh, UG E minus D sine over Z over D. And if you do this, it's just d over 2 of ug. Hello? And the integrated zona transport is u minus ug, because we have the ug component. Okay. And this is just ug e minus D sine over Z D. And this turns out to be equal and opposite to the uh, major transport. Okay. In a more general case where Vg is not equal to zero, then you get a V that is over to UG minus UG and then U that is minus equal to UG plus VG. Okay, in a more general case where the meridional geostrophic flow is not equal to zero. So we are here. You get a meridional transport. When the meridional geostrophic component is equal to zero, they're equal and opposite. In the general case, is given by this. Or you can write this as you know, the total meridional uh, Ekman transport is just is a mass transport. So you multiply by rho naught d over two, and then you have the two components from the two uh, integrated mass transport components in the u and v direction. Okay, so now you can look at this picture, which I think is very nice because it gives an idea of what's going on. So in the case of meridional component equal to zero, you just have a zonal geostrophic current, okay? And it's a geostrophic current because there's a pressure gradient, is in geostrophic balance, okay? So you have plus P and P minus, okay, so there's a pressure gradient that is causing this geostrophic zonal velocity. So this is down the pressure gradient. Okay, and so we've seen that the integrated velocity in the Ekman layer at the bottom are 45 degrees to the left of the uh, geostrophic current, right? And so we have this of minus F. And the overbar is vertically, vertically integrated. Okay, so you have the uh, geostrophic component, 
and then 45 degrees to the left was the solution for the integrated velocities, not transport. Okay, the integrated velocities are 45 degrees to the left for a bottom like Mallory. So the balance, the uh, integrated velocities at the bottom, they are balanced by bottom friction. Okay, so bottom friction goes this way. Minus tau at z equals zero. Okay, it's not the surface wind stress. We are in a bottom boundary layer where you feel stress with the bottom. So the geostrophic flow induces a integrated, vertically integrated, uh, agiostrophic currents that are 45 degrees to the left, and these are balanced by the stresses at the bottom, okay, which are opposite to that vertical integrated velocity. Now, the uh, total mass transport, which was this, okay, if you look at this and then you try to plot it, you will see that is giving you a total integrated mass transport in that direction, which is 45 degrees to the right of the stress. 90 degrees, sorry, 90 degrees to the right of the stress. Okay? And this is the, uh, this is the uh, solution. If you again, you start thinking about the uh, top ECMA layer in the ocean, you have a surface wind stress, 40, the velocities are 45 degrees to the right in the northern hemisphere, and then if you integrate the total mass transport of the uh, top ECMA layer, it's going to be 90 degrees to the right of the stress, right? Yes? Yes? <laughs> if you have questions, just I mean, you've seen this, this is the third time you see it probably, right? You've seen it in GFD and in atmospheric dynamics, I think. No? GFD and this one. In atmospheric dynamics, you haven't seen this? No? Maybe, maybe, not, maybe not the details. Also, okay, so at the top of my layer, you have the wind stress, you have tau, which is actually wind stress. The solution for the velocities, if you do the same, we can do it, is the velocities will be, integrated velocity will be 45 degrees to the right in the northern hemisphere. If you then integrate within the Ekman layer, the total mass transport of the top Ekman layer is 90 degrees to the right of the stress in the northern hemisphere. Right? You have a wind stress in that direction. Total mass transport in the Ekman layer is 90 degrees to the right. So that's the top. Maybe the most intuitive because it's the one that people study more. What is happening at the bottom? At the bottom, you, have, you don't have wind stress at the surface of the boundary layer, so you don't have wind stress here. You have stress with the bottom. Okay? So that's the stress that you have to think about. So you have a geostrophic velocity here on top of the Ekman layer. And that geostrophic velocity, we've seen that it induces a ageostrophic velocity within the Ekman layer. Even if you don't have meridional geostrophic velocity, you have U and V. Okay, and that's how you get spiral. So with a geostrophic velocity, zonal geostrophic velocity, you get some ageostrophic velocity within the Ekman layer. If you integrate vertically that ageostrophic velocity, it's going to be 45 degrees to the left of the geostrophic flow, not of the stress. Okay? This vertical integrated ageostrophic velocity is balanced by the stress at the bottom. Okay. So the stress at the bottom is in the opposite direction of this ageostrophic velocity. If you integrate vertically the uh, geostrophic velocities, the ageostrophic velocities, and you get the total mass transport, so you can get here A M E. Okay. That M E will be directed in this direction, which is actually 90 degrees to the right of the stress. Just like at the top Ekman layer, you have a stress and a total mass transport 90 degrees to the right. Here you have a stress, which is the stress at the bottom, and a 90 degrees to the right total mass transport for a positive defined F. Okay? Because sometimes when you, when you look at, at the beginning of the solution, you see a geostrophic flow, 
and then you see the integrated equine velocities and you see that they are 45 degrees to the left, you think that F doesn't, F doesn't swing you to the right anymore, but actually it does, right? This is just the integrated velocity. So the transport is 45 degrees to the, 90 degrees to the right of the stress. And this is the total transport. For a bottom battery. We'll, 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 do, we'll do that in a second. So you, you need a geostrophic, you need a geostrophic current, that geostrophic current and a stress, they create a boundary layer. Within the boundary layer, you have some ageostrophic velocities. The ageostrophic velocities depend on the geostrophic flow at the top, right? I mean, if you think of a wind blowing over land, uh, that wind blowing over the land will, with friction with the bottom will generate a boundary layer. And in that boundary layer, there will be some ageostrophic velocities. Those ageostrophic velocities will go 45 degrees to the left of the uh, geostrophic wind, so into the board, and that will be balanced by friction with the bottom. Okay? And then the total mass transport will be 90 degrees to the right of the stress, which is the stress at the bottom, so in that direction. Okay? And that's why I was saying that the top and bo the bottom atmospheric boundary layer and the top oceanic boundary layer, they're equal and in opposite direction. Because one is a boundary layer at the bottom with a total mass transport 90 degrees to the right of the friction. Whereas the one in the ocean is a top that is 90 degrees to the right of the wind stress. And so one will go in one direction and the other one will go in the opposite direction because one is a bottom boundary layer and the other one is a top boundary layer. This is where it's going, and uh, but what is the uh, so this is the integrated mass transfer of the bottom echo layer, okay? And then, as I said, we are really interested in the uh, in the vertical velocity at the edge of the boundary layer. Right? The details of the spiral are not very interesting here, so we really want to know what is the vertical velocity at the edge of the boundary layer and what it depends on. So now we can, we can derive that in a second. Okay, so within the Ekman layer, we have a vertical velocity and so the flow is no divergent. Okay, sorry, it's divergent, there's a no zero divergence. So we have du by x plus dv by y, okay? That is not going to be equal to zero. It's actually divergence, so you have divergence or convergence and you have a vertical velocity, that's what you have, okay? If you put the solutions that I just clear from the board, you get dg plus dg minus d by dy of Ug minus Ug. Okay. It's trying to look for the uh, divergence of the flow. And this is d over 2. dx Ug plus dy of Vg, the geostrophic divergence, minus dx of g plus dy of ug. Okay. So the ECMA flow is divergent, but we said that the uh, geostrophic flow is no divergent. Okay. So this is equal to zero. Because that's the uh, 
du by the x of ug plus dy of vg. And that's equal to 0 because the Jostoyevic flow is no divergent. Whereas the uh, Ekman part is divergent. So we're left with minus d e over 2 dx of vg minus dy of ug. Okay. And this is minus d over 2 of the vorticity of the geostrophic flow. So here you can make the analogy with the uh, surface So actually, if you remember the solutions that we had before for the bottom Ekman layer, the bottom Ekman layer, you have a top vertical velocity, which was the expression that we derived the last time, equal to 1 over rho, the curl of tau at the bottom, the friction at the bottom, over f, and that is d over 2, which is the vorticity of the geostrophic flow. Okay? So this was what we derived the last time. So you take this again. Vertical velocity is minus this, so you change the sign here. So the vertical velocity at the edge of the bottom boundary layer, so here, okay, is proportional to the vorticity of the geostrophic flow and the depth of the Ekman layer. Okay, so the vertical velocity at the bottom Ekman layer is given by the vorticity of the geostrophic flow and how deep is the boundary layer. So the analogy with the top Ekman layer is that you have at the, at the top of, in a top Ekman layer you have the wind stress giving you frictional stress and you need the curl of the wind stress, right? You don't need just the stress. You need the curl of the wind stress to provide the uh, vertical velocity. For a bottom Ekman layer, you don't have the curl of the wind stress, but you actually have the vorticity of the geostrophic flow. The vorticity of the geostrophic flow determines the vertical velocity at the bottom of the layer. Okay, so you need vorticity in the geostrophic flow to generate a divergence or a convergence in the boundary layer at the bottom. So for a bottom Ekman layer, you know, have the wind stress, you have stress at the bottom, and what provides the vertical, what, what determines the vertical velocity is the uh, vorticity of the geostrophic flow. Okay. okay, it's just that. Now for a surface boundary layer, which is basically just the same, we can just look at the notes. Okay, you do exactly the same, you look for exactly the same solutions for a surface like Malay, it's just the same equations, but then something important will change. So you start with the uh, interior, which is in just traffic balance, okay, Coriolis is balanced by the pressure gradient, just like before, and you have the frictional uh, momentum equation for the Ekman layer solution. Coriolis, the pressure gradient, and the frictional parameter, just like before, okay? So the frictional geostrophic balance, as we were before, is given by this, these two set of equations. And now you have different boundary conditions. Okay? At z equals zero, now you are at the top. And you have some stress at the surface. So at z equals zero, tau x is given by the surface stress. Okay? Tau x and tau y. And as z goes towards minus infinity, you go into the geostrophic part so that u is equal to ug and v is equal to vg. Okay? Those are going to be the boundary conditions for the top Ekman layer. 
We know it's a wind stress, so we introduce the kinematic wind stress. Tau is equal to tau over or not. Okay, you seek for the same solutions. They are slightly different, but very similar. Okay, so you have the ageostrophic velocity u and v, which depend on the geostrophic flow, plus all of this, which depends on the wind stress, tau x and tau y, tau x and tau y, and d, again, the depth of the boundary layer. Okay. You have again D is the uh, depth of the boundary layer. The solution of the top boundary layer depends only on the wind stress, not on the geostrophic flow. And now you can find the value and the direction of the surface velocity. So before we found the value of the velocities at the bottom, as Z was approaching zero, the bottom. Now we can find the value of the agiostrophic velocities at the surface. So for u at zero, you get simply this solution, and for v, again, this solution. OK, you know all this relationship, and you can find a solution for u0 and, and v0. Okay. If you reduce the problem to no meridional wind stress, the velocities at the surface, u0 and v0, are simply given by that, which can be rewritten as this. Okay? So this, this is saying that if you look from the top, again, you have x and you have y, you only have tau x in this case, we said that tau y is equal to zero, you have u minus ug in this direction and you have v minus vg which is minus tau x okay so it's going to be negative okay u minus vg is proportional to tau x so it's positive and v minus vg is proportional to minus tau x so it's negative defined and so the ageostrophic velocity is going to be 45 degrees to the right, as we know. Okay? And the bottom Ekman layer was 45 degrees to the left. Okay? The magnitude of the frictional flow in the x and y directions are equal to each other, and the ages of the flow is 45 degrees to the right, for obviously for positive defined f. Okay? I guess we all know this. This result does not depend on the size of the viscosity, we don't care about the details of the Ekman layer. Okay. This is always the right to 45 degrees to the right. So if you look at this nice schematics, I'm sure you've seen it, you have a wind in that direction, the velocity at the surface, so this is u naught and v naught. Okay, so these are the velocities at the surface are 45 degrees to the right. This is for the southern hemisphere, so it's 45 degrees to the left. And then, because of the viscosity within the boundary layer, you start forming the uh, famous spirals until reaching the solution matching the interior, where the ageostrophic velocity is equal to zero, and you just have geostrophic velocity or velocities in geostrophic balance. Okay, you've seen all this, right? So the, uh, the basic difference and, and what is important to remember is that for a surface Ekman layer, you need the curl of the wind stress to generate, oh, I think, we, I think we're gonna do it, okay? Yeah, so we, uh, we do again the transport for the top Ekman layer. Again, you integrate the transport in the zonal and meridional direction, and again, there are one depends on tau y, so u depends on tau y, and v depends on tau x. And this indicates that the ages of the time stress is perpendicular to the wind stress. Okay? And in the northern hemisphere is 90 degrees to the right. All right? Um, 
And again, the uh, vertical integrated properties, they do not depend they do not depend on the details of the Ekman spiral. It could be uh, thicker or it could be thinner. The important thing is that once you integrate the meridional, the transport in the Ekman layer, the solution is 90 degrees to the right in the northern hemisphere and 90 degrees to the left in the southern hemisphere. Okay. How thick or thin is the boundary layer? We are not interested too much in this case. Again, the, uh, the agiostrophic flow is divergent in the Ekman layer, that's why you have a vertical velocity at the edge of the Ekman layer, so it is divergent. So this is equal to the vertical integral of du dx plus dv dy. If you know what u and v are, you just do the derivative of this. And so the vertical velocity is just proportional to f and the curl of the wind stress. So for a bottom, this is for the bottom, and this is for the top. One over f curl of tau. Okay. So for the bottom at my layer, the vertical velocities are proportional to the uh, vorticity of the geostrophic flow, and for the top at my layer. The vertical velocity is proportional to the curl of the wind stress. Okay. And so, if you put if you put these two solutions together, I think I have a nice schematic here. Maybe. Okay, so here you have a top Ekman layer and a bottom Ekman layer. So here on the left, this is the wind stress, which is blowing into the board and out of the board. So into the board, the total mass transport within the Ekman layer is 90 degrees to the right. Okay, so in this direction, here is coming out of the board 90 degrees to the right. So there will be convergence, okay, the Ekman flow is divergent, so in this case there will be convergence and a vertical velocity associated with the curl of this wind stress that is directed into the geostrophic flow. Okay. And this is basically what is happening in the large-scale wind-driven jumps. Okay. So the uh, ECMA mass transport is generating a vertical velocity which is transmitting the curl of the wind stress to the interior of the ocean. If you look at the bottom ECMA layer, you have a geostrophic flow again into the board and out of the board okay so you have a vorticity associated with this geostrophic flow and that vorticity of the geostrophic flow is inducing a vertical velocity in this case it is directed towards the bottom generating a divergence so the total mass transport in the Ekman layer is in this direction okay and so if you put this on top of this, you basically have a bottom atmospheric Ekman layer on top of a top oceanic Ekman layer. Okay. And here is the other side of this idealized wind stress pattern. Okay, so the top Ekman layer, you have a vertical velocity which is proportional to the curl of the wind stress. And the bottom Ekman layer, you have a vertical velocity that depends on the vorticity of the geostrophic. And then it depends also on D, okay, but it's not important how, how deep D is. Okay, so that's the bottom line for the large scale ocean circulation of, of Ekman layers. Okay, here you have a summary of the details of the Ekman layer. The only thing that I want to point out is this. So you were saying that the bottom Ekman layer, the velocities are very weak, which is true. And somebody might think that the uh, agiostrophic velocities in the top Ekman layer are also very weak, which is true, but is also quite big, the area over which these large-scale wind patterns or wind stresses are acting on top of the ocean. 
So imagine a typical wind stress of 0.1 newton per meter squared, which is a reasonable number. That gives you a total mass transport in the Ekman layer of tau over rho f of 1 meter squared per second. Right? So if you integrate this mass transport over the width of the ocean, for example, the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean, okay? so you integrate that mass transport for 5,000 kilometers, you get a total volume transport of 5 times 10 to the 6 meter cube per second, which is one's vagum, so five vagums. Okay? So if you think of the large scale ocean circulation, you want to integrate the whole mass transport within the Ekman layer, which is not that much, could be 50 meters, 60 meters, okay? but it's over the, the whole ocean okay? for the large scale wind stresses. So the total mass transport of the Ekman layers within the Ekman layers is about five spectrums. If you remember the picture of the uh, zonal integrated uh, meridional Newtonian circulation, which uh, is somewhat, which is this, okay? So the Typical value for the uh, transport of the meridional, Atlantic meridional Albertonian circulation is, in this model is 26, the observed value is between 18 and 21. Okay? Between 18 and 21, Sverdrup is the volume transport of the Atlantic meridional Albertonian circulation, which is very important for climate, is very important for ocean circulation, is important for the atmospheric dynamics and everything. So the total meridional, the total meridional Albertonian circulation in the Atlantic is transporting 26 is vegetables. Okay? And the Ekman part at the top of the Atlantic is transported around 5 vegetables. So it's not that small. Okay? It's one fifth. Okay? So it's not def definitely not negligible. Okay? So the Ekman transport is quite large. And actually, when people observe, they measure the transports, for example, in the Atlantic, they decompose the uh, northward transport, for example, they do a a section between the Americas and Europe and Africa, okay? And they compute the transport, the total volume transport of the Atlantic Ocean from the surface to the bottom. They decompose the, uh, the transport in the interior flow, the ECMA flow, and the boundary contribution, which is not in geostrophic balance either, because you have a boundary, you have a boundary layer also near the, near the coast, okay? On the east and the west side of the basin. It's not just the top and bottom. And so they, they, they see that the, uh, the Ekman total transport is around five, six, four square groups. The uh, interior transport is about 18, 20, 21. Okay, so it's definitely not negligible. And it's also important for the variability of this transport because when you look at, let's say, decade of variability, uh, almost if not all of the variability is in this interior transport. But if you look at seasonal variability or interannual variability, a lot of the variability that you measure is within the Ekman part because it's driven by the winds. And so most of the seasonal variability and also interannual variability is in the wind-driven part. Right? So if you just measure the total volume transport of the ocean, you might see some time fluctuations. And on the seasonal and interannual part, most of that time fluctuation is given by the Ekman part. And the low frequency variability is mostly given by the interior part. So that's why it's also important to measure and to understand the, the Ekman component of the transport. Okay, so I'm done with Ekman layers. You will not see them again, <laughs> promised. Well, we'll talk about ECMO pumping for the winter and jays, but, but no, no ECMO solutions. Okay. So coastal upwelling, you were talking about coastal upwellings. Why do we care, well, why, how can you connect coastal upwelling and, uh, and ECMO dynamics is because of ECMO pumping and ECMO suction. Right? So, suppose you have a wind which is entirely meridional, and that should be tau y, no. It's entirely meridional, so tau x is equal to zero. Correct. Okay, so you have a coast, 
and you have a wind that is entirely meridional and positive. So you have a tau y positive. And uh, tau x is equal to zero. And so you have the total mass transport in the meridional direction is equal to zero. And the total mass transport in the x direction is uh, positive. So that transport would be to the left for F uh, negative, so in the southern hemisphere, and it will be to the right, as in this case, for F positive. Right? So this is just the total integrated mass transport in the Ekman layer. But now we are close to a coast. Okay? So continuity requires that there must be an inflow from the right of the wind in direction. So basically, you're pushing the water to the right within the Ekman layer, okay? And so away from the coast. And there's no way of filling up that gap horizontally. So in order to conserve mass, you need water to come from somewhere, and that's from the subsurface, okay? So that's how you generate a vertical velocity in that case. Okay, and that's called coastal upwelling. Okay, so in this case you have water coming up from the subsurface. It doesn't come all the way from the bottom. It usually comes from 200, 300 meters. Okay. This is actually a uh, plot from observations of Ekman pumping. So that W, the vertical velocity. So where is blue is positive and where is red is negative. So negative means into the ocean and positive means out of the ocean. Okay. Uh, here towards the equator there's no data because towards the equator geostrophy doesn't hold. So F goes to zero and Ekman pump and Ekman transport they are ill-defined. So here is negative meaning that there is a vertical pumping into the ocean. Okay. And that's because the winds, they go, you know, you have the uh, easterlies and the westerlies, the trade winds, and then the westerlies, they go in this direction. So the winds go like this. We are in the northern hemisphere, so we have mass transport to the right, mass transport to the right. There is a convergence and a downwelling of water. So you have vertical velocity into the ocean here, here, here. Whereas here towards the uh, poles, you actually have the opposite because you have these winds and these winds. So M is away from the center, and so you have divergence, and so you have upwelling of water from the subsurface. And so you have a positive Ekman pumping here, here. And also you have a, a large Ekman pumping close to Antarctica, and that's an upwelling because here close to Antarctica, you have the coast, you have the wind flowing in this direction. We are in the southern hemisphere. Mass transport to the left. Okay, so you create a divergence here, and water comes from below. And you have upwelling, basically, all along the Antarctic coast. And as we said during the first day, that's very important to close the meridional returning circulation. You have water sinking in the northern hemisphere, in the North Atlantic. Some gets up well through diffusion, but most of it go, gets up well close to Antarctica through upwelling in the Southern Ocean. Okay? And there's upwelling in the Southern Ocean because of a mass an Ekman mass transport away from the coast of Antarctica. Um, Okay, so you have basically these, you basically have four major upwelling regions, okay, they are called eastern boundary upwelling regions, and that's because the prevailing winds are towards the equator here, towards the equator here, 
towards the equator here and towards the equator here, generating a divergence in all these four cases and large upwelling systems. This is the one in the West Africa, Angola and Namibia, Peru, Chile and California. So you create a large upwelling regions. Usually these waters come from 200, 300 meters. They are rich in nutrients. They, when they are well close to the photic zone, there's a lot of uh, chlorophyll and there's a lot of fish and therefore a lot of fishing going on as well. Okay? So these four regions are very important, both for society and economic reasons. So these are the four major upwelling systems. And those four major upwelling systems are actually a problem for climate models. Because if you look at climate models and you do a difference between sea surface temperature in, within the models and sea surface temperature observed, and you compute a bias, a difference between the sea surface temperature in the model and the sea surface temperature in the observation, you see that the larger biases are actually close to the uh, eastern boundary upwelling systems. You see all these red globes. That's because these regions are very difficult to model because these regions are, are made of ocean atmosphere interactions. You need the wind stress providing the upwelling. Uh, so you need the right winds at the right place close to Antarctica, uh, close to the coast. Then you need uh, small scale effects in the ocean as well. You need to upwell the right waters because you might have the right upwelling, the right magnitude and the right place but you are upwelling the wrong water. So in your model you have a bias, let's say your subsurface water is too warm or too cold. Right? So you're providing the right physical mechanism at the right place, you have the right upwelling in the right place, the right volume flux of upwelling, but you're just upwelling the wrong water, okay? which is too warm or too cold. And so you get a bias in sea surface temperature and if you have a biogeochemical module, you're also perhaps upwelling water that is not rich in nutrients. So you're not generating uh, chlorophyll and phycoplankton. Okay? So it's very difficult to, to model because you need resolution, but you also need to have the right ocean circulation and atmospheric circulation. It's not just a matter of resolution. People have done high resolution models of these regions and things improve because you have a better coastline, you have winds that are better in place with the coastline, generating the right uh, ECMO pumping. Okay, so a lot of things improve with the resolution, but not everything. But anyway, that's that's a problem for a uh, couple models nowadays. Then you have equatorial upwelling, of course. Okay, here the boundary is not a coast, but the boundary is the equator. Right, I guess you've seen this. So the uh, the boundary here is given by the equator. So you have the uh, easterlies. Uh, blowing in this direction, the trade winds. You know the, in the northern hemisphere, the mass transport is to the north. In the southern hemisphere, the mass transport is to the south. And so you create a divergence, upwelling at the equator, and you form the, uh, the cold tongue in the, uh, in the Pacific, for example. And this is a cross section of the same. So you have the winds blowing into the board, you generate divergence, and then upwelling close to the equator. So you have a shoaling of the isopic knots. And actually, there's a, there's a current associated with this. Here we're going back to a coastal upwelling. Uh, this is, for example, uh, uh, the uh, California or the Canaries upwelling. Okay, you have the coast here, and you have the winds blowing towards the equator. So you have a mass transport to the right, away from the coast and you have an upwelling, a coastal upwelling from the subsurface towards the surface. Okay? When you have the upwelling, what you're doing is you're sloping the isopycnals. They, let's say, used to be flat. You have upwelling, the isopycnals, they slope towards the coast. And because they slope towards the coast, then you have a pressure gradient. And in the northern hemisphere, that pressure gradient will generate a geostrophic flow that is actually towards the equator as well, just like the wind. Okay, and these are actually called these are actually the uh, eastern boundary currents. When we will see the wind-driven gyres, so if this is America and this is Europe and Africa, 
that will be the gyre. Right. And here we have the, uh, the Gulf Stream, the Western Boundary Current, very strong. And here we have an Eastern Boundary Current. And part of the Eastern Boundary Current is generated by the uh, coastal upwellings. So the wind in this direction, mass transport away from the coast, upwelling, the upwelling slopes, the, uh, the isotopic knolls, and then you, you, you get balance in just, well, you, you get in just balance, and you have a just trophically balanced current towards the equator as well. Then you need to conserve, right? Then for mass conservation, you have a surface current towards the equator, and you generate a poleward undercurrent below the upwell. Yes? No? You don't know? I don't know how the polar current arises. The polar current arises because you have a sloping isopiclone in this way, okay? And then in order to conserve mass, the isopiclone is actually sloping the opposite case in the subsurface. And so you have a geostrophically balanced surface current, in this case, away from the boat. So towards the equator, and a subsurface polar undercurrent that is actually going towards the pole, okay. and that balances that balances uh, the transport. And that's it. Two minutes.